Well, hi, ladies and gentlemen. We're closing out Q1 with the S&P down 3.4%. We've got the NASDAQ down nearly 8%. We're closing down the month and the quarter with the gold price slightly higher. We've seen a very volatile crude price indeed. But we look forward to what could be a very lively Q2 going forward as well. The yield curve screams recession, and we bring in a very special guest indeed. We look at all these factors and more as we go inside the trade-off. Well, hi guys, my name is Chris Weston. I'm Head of Research here at Pepperstone. In a minute, I'm gonna be joined by Blake Morrow from Forex Analytics. And we're gonna bring in a very special guest who I'll introduce in a second indeed. But we're gonna be unpacking, we're gonna be navigating and creating all the different landmines that we're seeing in these crazy worlds of financial markets as we close out the quarter, if we close out the month and we look ahead into what could be a landmine filled Q2 going forward and something that we need to navigate as traders and manage those risks as well. So let's bring Blake into the program. Blake, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great, Chris. Good to see you. Good to see you, mate. Look, we've uh, obviously closing out the quarter. Um, risk assets have had a, a pretty torrid time. Yeah, we're sort of closing today on a slightly negative tone. I feel older. I certainly look older. You definitely look older uh, and a little bit grayer. What have we learned over the quarter and how are you feeling? I've learned that uh, the market can go a lot further than you think just at the uh, right here as, as, as people race to the end of the quarter and <laughs> Japan's uh, fiscal year end. Um, oh, yeah. We've seen assets actually have a nice bounce over the last several weeks. So Yeah, that's good stuff. Well, do you know what? We've got so much to unpack. So uh, let's go into Topical Funder and go through those factors. Okay, um, well, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in, in FX markets, specifically the euro and the yen, because, you know, we've seen those, those currencies really moving around quite wildly. Um, I think what's interesting is we've seen a breakout in the euro um, with the inflation numbers coming out of, of Europe really super strong, like crazy, crazy strong. Those numbers that we saw in Spain, 9.8%, clearly they've got a bit of an issue going forward. Uh, we've got the, the, the actual sort of group Eurozone inflation numbers coming out in the session ahead. Um, we have seen you know, inf uh, numbers in, in Europe in terms of rates, pricing uh, the European, uh, the central bank uh, rate going back into positive territory by the end of the year. We've also seen massive volatility in the Japanese yen, one way traffic, and it's really promoted the Bank of Japan to stop intervening in the market. You know, out of those two, what we call traditional funding currencies, you know, which one have you been most active in uh, recently and why? Actually, ironically, Chris, I've been very active in both. I And one of my setups today happens to be with the yen uh, because I've been quite active over the last 24, maybe 36 hours. And I'll get to that a little bit later. But the euro as well, I happen to be long a lot of euro crosses. And the fact is, as you're pointing out, they are funding currencies. And you're seeing the euro break higher despite the ongoing you know, invasion of Ukraine. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about this as the show goes on, I'm sure. Yeah. But the fact is, is the euro is starting to peak its way a little higher. So, you know, can it, get, can it, keep, can it keep going higher? Can it keep going higher? I think it can. Yeah. It's a funding currency. What happens if what happened? To, what happens if risk assets take a spill? Right. That's when you're going to see these these funding currencies really take off. So yeah. I don't know, Chris, I, I've i been playing them both on the long side, more the yen just over the last 24 hours, 40, 36 hours, something like that. Yeah. But recently, I like playing them. How about you? Yeah, look, I think the yen's a really interesting one. It's just been one way, one way, one way traffic selling all day long. And it's just been a, it's been a, a yeah, currency trading 101. It's just been a rates differential trade. What we're seeing now, when dollar yen got up to 125, yeah, it was predictable. I mean, you know, go back in time uh, through various factors. Whenever they looked to jawbone in the market, it's around 125. The same thing happened here. Pretty much on the day, we saw two Bank of Japan members coming out and saying they're watching currency markets very closely. Look, the Bank of Japan can't do anything in the currency markets. It's the Ministry of Finance who are ultimately going to be the ones who buy in the market. They can change Correct. negative interest rates and they can change the yield curve cap target from the 10-year down to the five year, but you know, it's the Ministry of Finance ultimately who one day would go out and buy Japanese yens, but they wouldn't do that until dollar yen was well above 130 in my opinion. But what it's done is, is it's taken a bit of um, you know, solace out of the yen in terms of people looking to sell. And we're seeing rate differentials coming back because Jap US Treasuries are starting to find a bid. So I think dollar yen and the yen crosses that, 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 you know, that bid is, is done. 
but I think the euro is a really interesting one. They've got an inflation problem there, and that needs to be managed. And I think you've got stagflation clearly playing through. So, yeah, it's a really interesting place, euro. It really is. And I'm glad you brought up both of them because we're going to talk about them at length, I think, for the remainder of the show. But I want to just turn our attention back over to the S&P. And I say back over because last week, I brought up the S&P saying, well, the S&P is really not the economy, right? The economy might be doing this, but the S&P continues to rally. But my question now is, have stocks actually topped? You know, you, Chris, we're in a situation where the Ukraine you know, uh, invasion, it seems like, seems like, let's let's all cross our fingers, that it is de-escalating somewhat. Yeah. But if you notice the market, one of my colleagues brought this up, we're, we are multiple percent higher today than where we are when the invasion started, just yep. FYI. Now, the, the, the thing that we have to think about as far as the economy, <laughs> is the economy better off now after the invasion or worse? And you just brought up inflation out of out of Spain that just came out. I mean, how big of an issue is this, you know, just shortage of everything going to be and going to weigh on the global economy, Europe and everybody else? So what are your thoughts here, Chris, regarding the stock market? I mean, oh, and I should say, just I need to mention this. You know, everybody was looking at the S&P and saying, OK, when we get to the 200 day moving average, it might stop, myself included. That would one of them would be me. Yeah. We rallied well up beyond that. We rallied above February's highs enough just enough to squeeze out anybody that was short now we're stalling today as you pointed out today we're a little lower so i don't know i'm 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 almost thinking the market got caught might be getting caught off sides right now especially yeah. with people like tom lee projecting that we're going to see new highs or i forget what is his 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 he's made some good calls at tom lee i mean at the end of the day but mate yeah. Yeah, we're, we're saying this the day before quarter end and crazy, mysterious stuff happens the day before quarter end. Tomorrow, right. on the first day of the quarter, that's when things become real. And, uh, you know, we'll say, but yeah, do you know what I want to do, Blake? I want to be short the market right now. Um, and I want to be short risk. And, and, and I, you know, we're, we're, we're doing it into an uptrend. It's not really my style. I like things to be actually going down before I start shorting. That's when the bid dries up. So, you know, you know if I'm going to do it now, it's certainly be, probably be in the queues or be in the NASDAQ. I think that's the place to go. So, look, I've seen, just seen some crazy shit going on. We Apple was up, what, 11 straight days in a row? Like, why was it doing that? You know, 11 straight days in a row. It's all call buying, short dated call buying that's being delta hedged from, from market makers. You know, the optionality is, is huge at the moment going through there. But we've got options. So we've got, we've got earnings coming through on the 13th of April. That's the big day. JP Morgan kicks that off. Earnings in the US have not been coming down for all this crazy stuff that's been happening, this slowdown in growth. I think we're due to see an earnings downgrade. I think that's going to come through in this, this earnings season. Um, I think also corporate buybacks have been a massive part of why we've been seeing the equity market higher, um, as well as the, just the traditional flow. And as we go into earnings season, those buybacks will dissipate. They're not allowed to buy during that period. So that's going to be your natural buyer of stocks out of the market. If real rates go up at the same time, that to me is going to be red rag to a bull. And I think we go lower in that situation. And one last comment. How about if you're a portfolio manager? you got to mark up your portfolios right now as we head into quarter end. Because yeah. if you're not invested and you're underperforming the market, my money is going to come out of your fund. So, right. I mean, that's, that's another thing you got to think about, too. Anyway. Yeah, look, I want to bring I want to bring Tracy Shikart into the into the program. Tracy, yeah, there she is. Where is she? Tracy, how are you doing? Tracy's at uh, Hedge Fund Telemetry. Um, look, Tracy, we've known each other for a long time. I know you know Blake really well. Everyone on Twitter knows you. You're a massive personality on there. So it's fantastic to have you on the show. Um, I want to talk to you about some of your views because you're really well known for your views on emerging markets, specifically around energy. That's when your big sort of be a big calls are going through. So we've got you on today to to give us some of those views. I think I think people are going to really welcome them as well. So welcome to the show, Tracy. Thanks for coming on board. I want to talk to you a little bit. And Blake, yeah, feel free to to to, to come in with questions whenever you want. We've got Russia, Ukraine, obviously in the mix. That's something that you've had to sort of talk to your clients a little bit about. We've got China targeting five and a half percent GDP but they've got this COVID zero policy. So demand's obviously coming through there. Yeah, what do you, let's take a view specifically on, on the crude market right now. Uh, we're still holding the uptrend, you know, putting a gun to your head. Um, you know, do, are, you, are you bullish or are you bearish <laughs> or do you think we're going to trade a range in the short term now? Uh, I, I mean, I would like to see the market move sideways 
right to now, but fundamentally, the market is still a very tight market. We've seen uh, 1.5 million barrels taken off of the market from Russia so far, and that's with them already placing orders in March before the invasion happened. So we're really looking forward into, to April to really see how much of a dip this is going to cause. Yeah. Um, then we also have to look at the other side of China, obviously locking down. That's going to cause a problem for the energy markets as well as this uh, Iran deal, but uh, which is also suspect. And it doesn't really matter because 1.5 million, 1.0 million barrels into the markets over a year doesn't really do anything for the market. So yeah. we're in a very precarious situation as we speak right now. I mean, we're really looking at the Russian market and how many barrels are going to be actually taken off the market at this yeah, point. Cool. Well, I was just going to say, what do you think about OPEC? We're saying this the night before uh, the OPEC meeting as well. I think that the, the wide consensus is we don't see a huge amount of change from the previously agreed 400,000 barrels of output increases. Um, but, you know, with everything we're seeing, is there, is there a possibility um, that, that we see more output or is, just, is this going to be a non-event in your eyes? In my, It's going to be a non-event. I think they'll go ahead with the 400K BPD as planned. So, hey, no other, oh, sorry. They have no other reason not to. No. And they've they so much stated so. So I think it's a non-event. Yeah. So, you know, hey, Tracy, good to see you, by the way. So, <laughs> <Harry>. <laughs> no, no uh, but what I wanted to say, what I wanted to say is, you know, price action in crude has been really, I've been watching it very closely, especially, you know, you and I, we have uh, spoken to actually in recent weeks, talked a lot about crude and that hundred dollar mark, we found buyers just below there. What was it yesterday on that dip yep. below a hundred? You know, I think that really drew that, you know, the, you call it, call it the imaginary line in the sand, like for bulls. I, I think bulls want to see a daily close above 100. But if we start trading back in the 90s, do you think we could actually, you know, get some relief here with, with energy uh, costs or energy prices at this point? Do you, do you think it could take us back into the 80s, maybe lower? No, I think that you're going to find dip buyers all the way there just because of the tightness of this market, the physical market is very tight. You know, if you look at crude, if you look at just the US, which is Cushing, right? We're at back down at 22.4 million barrels. That's ridiculously low. So that's why we're seeing spreads blow out again, right? In, in the, the US. And so I think the markets are tight everywhere. Everybody is worried about this everywhere. And um, so I don't think that you're going to see this dip back into the to the 80s at this juncture, unless we see some sort of material input back into the market. Yeah. Trish, so I wanna, so oh, guess what, Chris? That, mean, that means $150 uh, to top off your tank still oh, moving forward. Don't say, I'm just, uh, I'm walking from now on, Blake, don't worry. Tracy, I want to I talk to your view on gold. Um, you know, we've seen real rates being quite correlated with the gold price. Um, people have been saying they've been using it for all different types of hedging activity. Um, what, what's your view in the near term on gold? And, and you know, what is the investment thesis for, for gold, you know, long or short? I mean, I, to be honest, I mean, gold's been sideways for years right now. Um, but I lean towards the upside right now, just because if you look at today, we just started seeing rationing talking about in Germany, Netherlands and France for natural gas. Right. So we're talking this is this is kind of the scare. This is why you want to be long gold at this point. Right. If we're talking, we're, at, we're rationing energy, <laughs> which means a complete recession in the European markets yeah. if these countries actually resort to that. Yeah. And so I think right now, I think gold is a safe haven. I think it's poised to go higher. Um, and I like it from a mining standpoint as well. Yeah, good stuff. I want to talk to your view on the on the dollar because obviously that drives so much of, of the commodity thesis. It, you know, you've, you've been big in the emerging markets. So what's your view on, on the US dollar at the moment? Well, I think the problem is that we have higher commodity prices and higher USD at this point. And that's really a horrible storm for 
emerging markets. So what's going to happen, in my opinion, is that the central banks will have to get together at some point and say, we need to bring down the value of the dollar. I mean, if we hit 110, we're going to have a huge problem. So I think we'll have to see a coordinated central bank movement to bring the value of the of the dollar down so that the entire world doesn't sink into a hole. <laughs> you, you know, Tracy, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and you're talking about emerging market currencies. One of the things that actually uh, Chris and I have been talking a lot about over the last couple of months is the out, the the outperformance of emerging market currencies in this environment, and you're seeing them stronger. But I think maybe the fear is that the dollar really takes a turn and starts rallying strongly against those emerging market currencies, and you would think that that would be a big issue for those countries. Well, exactly, especially if most of their debt is denominated in dollars. So we have to just keep an eye on that. I mean, a lot of the emerging market currencies that have um, rallied or have at least stayed OK are uh, commodities based currencies. Right. Yeah. So you're looking at like the real or the you know, anybody that has any country that is commodities based is doing OK right now. But everybody else is on the border. Quick, quick one, Tracy. Before we let you go, um, in the AM space, what's uh, what's your your preferred play? What's your preferred region at the moment? I really like South America right now, to be right. honest. Yeah. Um, because they they have a lot of uh, commodities based. So uh, you know, I would uh, go with the, the Real right now, which is not a popular idea, but. Yeah, I, I think right. I, I, I totally agree. I think that's a great place to be. Anyway, we're going to wrap this section up. Thank you very much, Tracy, for some of your thoughts there. Fantastic to hear uh, some, what, what's going through your mind and your thought process at the moment. And we're going to go to that's a setup to look at some of the technicals. Okay, well, this uh, Blake, let's uh, let's go into something that's really come up onto a lot of people's radars at the moment, and that is the US yield curve. So not a technical setup per se. Um, which is about as good as French as I can come up with. But uh, you can see a situation here where the twos, tens yield curve went inverted. What that means in layman's terms is the 10-year Treasury yield, um, the expected return you get over the duration of that, that bond, uh, went with a, with, a, with a lower yield than, than two-year Treasury. So what you're lending the US government for two years, effectively the yield on that, traded at a premium to 10-year yields. Now, what you can see on the right-hand side is, is, is the 10-year yield has traded inversely, or should we say invertedly, relative to two-year yields. So the yield is lower. Now, since I think uh, since the 60s, this is really, whenever we've seen this inversion play through, it's always predicted a recession. Somehow it managed to do it through COVID, a lot of cynicism, and this time could well be different, Blake. But, uh, you know, since 1978, this has always really predicted a a recession. It's taken about 19 months from that initial inversion to take through before we actually get the technical recession. Um, but you know, this has been something that, that has been very well talked about up on Twitter and social media. And I will say when we actually get inversion, the stock market actually performs quite well. It's when you get that that kick back up and the 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 after inversion we actually get a steepening that the market starts to worry. So what do you think about this? How worried should we be, if at all? Oh, well, I think we should be worried. Now, first of all, the, the blue denotes the, the recession. recession period. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. Absolutely. So, you know, looking at this chart, why would today be any different than the the past, you know, 30 years? I, I don't see, it, it, if anything, it's going to be worse, Chris, because of the amount of liquidity that has been sloshing around in the market for as long as it has been. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I think we should be worried. I think it is something that we do have to think about, especially if you're in the retail space or if you're in you know some sort of consumer consumer driven based business or investments. I think that's where you have to really be concerned. You know, yeah. uh, that that'd be my own personal opinion. What I do you think here? Yeah, I mean, I just wrap this up quickly because I'm going to get my producer coming down the air in a minute. But uh, yeah, I, I yeah. mean. Uh, the Fed have said they're not worried about this. They, this has been, you know, they're looking at other parts of the yield curve. I know the market's looking at What I will say, and I'll just repeat this, is that um, the equity returns have actually been positive. In the 12 months out since 1978, when you see inversion, the equity returns on average have been about 10%. So don't just think the world's about to collapse. 
But this has been a good predictor of, of, of tougher times. And the fact that the Fed are about to go on a, a massive hiking spree uh, when the curve's flat, nothing really ever good comes of that. But I wouldn't be selling risk on the back of that. It's when the yield curve starts radically steepening that's the time when everyone needs to get defensive and we start shorting markets much more aggressively. So just a bit of context on what we've been seeing on the yield curve there. Well, thanks for bringing that up because you just scared the pants off of me, yeah. uh, Chris. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scare the pants off of somebody who's a crypto trader. Uh, look, I'm, I'm looking at Bitcoin. We are nudging our head up against a uh, the 200 day moving average. This is really, uh, and I'm, I hate to steal your thunder, but I did because I was going to do it anyway today because <laughs> last week, you said I wanted to short Bitcoin and I'm like, I'm like, you know, that's not a bad idea. But nah. now it's kind of where it's at. We're sitting right up against that 200 day moving average. We have a Gartley pattern that's setting up. A lot of people might, you know, you know, pester me on exactly what harmonic pattern that is. I see it as a Gartley, but that's actually a reversal pattern. And it's had a nice rally. It's had a nice rally over the last couple of weeks. I think tactically you could be short here looking for a move back below 45 Forty-five eight drops us right back towards you know forty-one, forty-two thousand. What are your thoughts here, Chris? Well, I didn't short Bitcoin last week, I and mean, anyone who did, and on, on me saying that, apologies. But uh, you know, we make bad calls, don't we? So, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think at the moment, if, if we are going to see, um, if we are going to see uh, risk coming out, if we do think that the equity market's got a bit, a bit of downside, which I suspect that's where the risk lies uh, once we get past quarter end, then I suspect quarter, then Bitcoin and, and crypto has got a bit more downside as well. But we've had a really nice momentum move. I actually wanted to see this kick on. We've been putting some, some ideas out in trading view that we could see this uh, trade as a FOMO momentum trade and this could continue going higher. But that 200 day moving average was something that came up on the radar. The sellers have failed to push that through. I, I, I'd, you know, I'd flip that decision. And if it broke and closed above the 200 day moving average, you know, I'd stay long in that situation because we're going to see further yeah. momentum. But if we get a break that back below that, that red horizontal form of breakout level, then I think, you know, that's just going to accelerate the selling. And again, it's going to come down to risk in the market there. So, yeah, it, it does worry me that, that the market's just, just turned on a dime on that 200 day moving average. And if we do kick back below that form of breakout zone, yeah, that's going to be quite a powerful, uh, you know, sell signal in my opinion. So yeah, I think I'm I'm with you there, mate. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's one of the best risk proxies out there, as you pointed out. Yeah, so just a we high beta play. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it if the is. if if the Nasdaq's going to be down one percent, you you, I mean, that correlation's broken down a little bit, but you know, really, when you know, for the last couple of years, we've seen Nasdaq down one percent. Uh, Bitcoin down two and a half, three three percent in that situation. So high yep. beat to move there. And one that's just come. We talked about it earlier. I want to. I just want to flip this to, to euro dollar because we've seen a really nice breakout. We could have used euro sterling as well because that's a you know it's a bit of a boring currency. We don't see a huge amount of business in it because you know you you do have two economies that are somewhat similar. It's kind of like Aussie Kiwi in a way. Uh, but euro sterling's broken out. But we've got euro dollar here because it's the one all the you know all the all the everyone loves to trade. And we, we brought this last week in the idea of, can it break out the top end of the range? Well, it has done. The question is now, can this start bull trending? Yeah, there's a lot of cynicism that we're going to see a bull trend in the euro dollar. But we've got an inflation number that's going to come out tonight. We've got an inflation problem in Europe, obviously driven by some of the stuff that Tracy was talking about there. Um, is, this a is this a fake out? Are we going to see this kickback lower? Um, or is this going to start trending? You know, for me, the momentum model is there. I want to see those I want to see those Bollinger Bands widen. I want to see it hold the five-day exponential moving average on any kind of pullbacks. And then, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be looking to sort of trail that up. But uh, this is a really interesting one. It's a setup that has potential. What do you think? Well, you know, I've been waiting for the breakout above 111.20, the daily yeah. close above it. Today, early this morning in North America, you were you were probably sleeping at the time or just about ready to go to sleep. Yeah. It dipped back down to 111.20, held it. I went long right there. And so I'm actually long the euro currently, Chris, and Whoa. I like it. I think it's bullish. Now, you know, I think that this inflationary pressures that you're seeing in Europe is very real. And I think the central banks are going to have to fight. It is not something that the market was anticipating. Everybody looked at the Fed and they priced in, hey, the Fed's going to raise rates four times this year, or, you know, back in January. Uh, you know, recently in the last couple of weeks, oh, they're going to raise rates seven or eight eight times in 2022, maybe half a basis point here and there. And you know what? The, the dollars said, hey, OK, so what do you got for me now? Well, I'll <laughs> tell you what, the ECB might have something to say about uh, the inflation that we saw out of Wait, Spain. Let me, yeah, let me tell you about that, though. The ECB, this is the conundrum they're facing. IFO, IFO survey, awful. 
thematic of a recession. ZEW expectations, very poor indeed. They've got sky high inflation. They've got a markets that are now expecting the, the, the European Central Bank rate to be zero or 60 basis points of hikes throughout this year. That to me is a toxic mix. High inflation, very high inflation, a slowing economy, consumer confidence getting crashed. Why do you want your money in Europe? You really don't, but the euro's rallying on the back of those interest rate moves you're seeing. It's because it's a funding currency, funding Chris. Currency, it's a yep. funding currency. It's not going to act the way that you think. And that's what Japan and the yen has done for the last 20 years for those of us that have been trading currencies for 20 years. So speaking of the yen, look at the uh, look at the New Zealand yen. This is my, um, this is my setup. I, I love it. Uh, it it's because... I see this as a big confluence of Fibonacci levels. If anybody knows me from, from, from trading, you guys knew that back in the 90s, I learned to do Fibonacci analysis on pieces of paper with protractors, physical <laughs> protractors. I keep, I keep in my office. I, used to, I mean, we used to print out it would t take three hours to download, you know, that, that beat, 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 beat. Did you, your mum you like, for, your I just imagine a, a young Blake walking there, like playing hopscotch and pushing a, a wooden, <laughs> wooden hoop down the road as fun. <laughs> hey day. man, I was in my, I was in my twenties. <laughs> however, however, the thing is, is, you know, we, we had this big fib confluence, the 161% extension of the last big leg lower. And also the 78% retracement of like the last five-year move, that comes up right around the 86, 80, 86, 80, 87 yen level. We are going into fiscal year end tonight. As you guys are watching this, I'm just hoping, hoping with my fingers crossed that we get a little bit of yen weakness going into tonight and it spikes us up just a little bit and I'm going to sell in a strength. If I can get a, an order off somewhere in the 86 to 87 level. I've got a couple orders spread out there. I'm looking to actually sell this against that, knowing where my risk is. Yeah. And I have been playing this one on the short side three times in the last 36 hours, all profitable, you know, just selling into these rallies. Trader. So I like it here. Yeah. No, I, what do you think? I, I, I think the yen, the yen weakness is done for now. Um, I still structurally can't like the yen other than just. Um, a, a repositioning. Nothing goes up in a linear fashion yeah. forever. Um, I mean, I, I just, I still hate the yen from a longer term perspective. It's everything still remains uh, the reason to be shorting it. But that said, um, you know, positioning is very, very rich, and you've got a central bank now who's just trying to ward a few people off. So yeah, I, I'd probably share that there's, there's there's a bit of downside in this cross. Um, I, yeah, I'd be looking at the yen and saying which one do I want? Yeah, we've got dollar yen could be an interesting one ahead of payrolls. I think payrolls are going to disappoint. Um, and therefore, maybe you choose your currency. But I think, yeah, you get a little bit of strength in the yen, and I'd be looking to, to, to structurally change that one as well. Anyway, let's go into our plays of the day, and let's see what's going through uh, Blake's and my mind for the week ahead. Well, I'm going to look at uh, Sterling uh, against the Norwegian crown, the knock or as I've put there, knocking the pound down, which is a bit of a play on words there. <laughs> yeah, very theatrical. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, I think the, the problem with being uh, short the, the pound is we are going into April and there is no currency that performs better than the pound uh, in April. For whatever reason, people like buying pounds. Uh, if you look at cable in, in April, 80% of the time, uh, it's closed up in the month of April by an average of 1.4%. So... Is this time different? Well, seasonal factors suggest not not um, selling the pound. But that said, you know, short dollar Nokia is also one of the best trades to to do through April as well. Now, I've looked at this trade because um, yeah, I think it's overcooked. If I have a look at the distance between the three and the nine day exponential moving average, just to see how powerful that's got a bit overcooked. Um, we are trading a little bit lower relative price relative to its five day exponential. So I think we, 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 we will see some heat coming out of this. I think we'll see a bit of a rally in the short term. Um, but I think if we get back into that first orange line, I think that's going to be the level that I want to look to sell into to continue this momentum trade going down. So I think everything's a, bit, a little bit overcooked at the moment. Uh, Sterling likes April, but I, you know, structurally, I think that the pound has some big downside going forward. So I'd be looking to sell into that orange line there. Well, that's, that's a good statistic to know for us FX traders. So thank you so much, Chris, for that. Uh, I'm going to take you into the German DAX. Big and call this time, is the big call time. <laughs> <laughs> the DAX, 
is dead. Part two, <laughs> maybe part three. I can't remember. Exactly. How many. Our, 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 our esteemed producer said it was, this may have been the third time, but that I've called this, but anyway, the Dax died. It's bounced back. We had a nice dead cat bounce, bounced right into the levels it was supposed to Chris. I mean, look, that support going back to May of 2021, we tagged 14,800, what, once, twice, three times, four, five, seven, eight, I don't know. We came back up there, probed just above it, just enough to squeeze out a few people and then reversed on a dime. And I think that's great because now as a trader, you know exactly what your risk is. Hit the 618 retracement, rejected. Hit trend line, rejected. Hit the 14.8 level, rejected. The <laughs> DAX is dead jesus blake's on fire Done. today he's fired up mic drop <laughs> you've got um you've got a pretty clear defined risk right you've got you've got to stop above the 61.8 you've got to stop above the rising or the, the the downtrend um you know if it closes and breaks that you've probably got some upside but you know you see you've, you've, you know your risk and and and, and yeah i mean you i think when you've when you've said the dax is dead obviously uh, a bit of hyperbole there but uh I you've know. called it quite well i think yeah last two times well i was a little early a little early Early isn't always right. Early is wrong. So, yeah. Yeah. so I was just a little early. Yeah, good stuff. All right, well, we'll call it a day there. Like you, if, if you've got anything that you want to talk to, to, to Blake or myself or even something, something that Tracy said, jump in on the conversation. Leave a comment. Last week, there was loads of comments, some really, really good, well-articulated points that people put across. So, yeah, keep, the, keep those comments coming. Give us a like if, if you like the show. And I suppose if you are continuing to watch at this point, you probably do. So that's great. Keep the likes coming. We appreciate them, both Blake and myself and Tracy. Uh, and yeah, we'll see you more for next week for more of the trade-off.